truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus left the temple. So what are all these things that will come upon this generation? Simply put, the penalties that were promised in the curse of the law in Deuteronomy. The curses for rejecting God. The same curses seen at the time of Jerusalem's fall to Babylon. It was about to happen all over again because Israel's leaders had misused their authority and missed the time of their visitation. Innocent people, as always, would be the ones to pay the price. Hi, I'm Tyler Don Rosenquist, and welcome to Character in Context, where we explore the historical context of Scripture and talk about how it bears on our own behavior and witness as image bearers. You can find my teachings on my website, theancientbridge.com and contextforkids.com, as well as on my YouTube channels, which are accessible from those websites. You can also access past broadcasts on my podcast channel, characterincontext.podbean.com, and my context books for adults and families are available through amazon.com. And my podcasts are available on iTunes now, and you can get to that through my podcast site. There's a link. Now, in 586 BC, the southern kingdom of Judea was led into exile after repeatedly, over the course of hundreds of years, refusing to hear God's warnings through his prophets against idolatry and oppression. Those were God's two hot-button issues. You don't worship any other gods, and you don't treat his people like Pharaoh treated their ancestors. But Israel was never exclusively monotheistic before the exile, not at any time. Even King David, the man after God's own heart, had a household idol in his bedroom big enough to masquerade as a human being under the covers as we see in 1 Samuel 19. They practiced not monotheism, but something called henotheism, where God was on top of the pyramid but many other regional gods were seen as subservient to him. Not to be confused with polytheism, where people worship many gods who work in cooperation to run the universe. There are uh, clay pottery fragments um, dug up in, in Israel, at, at which picture and are inscribed with the words yod heh vav -Heh and his Asherah. That's the mother goddess of the Canaanites, portrayed as God's consort. In Ezekiel, we see that Tammuz was being wept for in the temple in order to bring back the rains. And I have a blog post on that, on my blog post, the uh, ancientbridge.com. Uh, just uh, type Tammuz into the search engine. You can bring that up. And that they were baking unleavened bread for the queen of heaven, Ishtar. And I have another... I have actually two blog posts on her. You can, you can look at that because I won't be teaching that here. We see that an Asherah was set up in the temple, although we don't actually know what an Asherah was. It's one of those archaeological mysteries. Some versions of the Bible add pole behind Asherah, but we have zero archaeological or literary solid evidence for what they were. And Hebrew never reflects the word pole. Yeah, that's added in by, by translators. We only know they were wooden, so it could have even been a tree, could have been idle, and, and thus none survive because wood doesn't do well over the centuries. If you want some to survive, it needs to be pottery or it needs to be metal, something like that. Um, but the point is that Israel had other gods in, in Adonai's face continually, even under David. 
Ever since the death of Joshua, actually, it was a blind spot. But we have to remember that even though David had a Taraf, he was still considered to be a man after God's own heart. We are the product of our culture, and uh, God's very merciful in that regard. And he, he really does overlook an awful lot if we're really, really doing what we know and, and, and doing well otherwise. It's something that I don't understand. I wouldn't be so merciful, honestly. But then if he wasn't so merciful, I'd be a pile of, you know, charred concrete. Or I'd be, you know, charred whatever right now. Now, what broke the camel's back was the oppression going on of Jew against Jew, rich against poor. People were refusing to release their debt slaves after their six years of service were up. They were condemning poor Jews to perpetual servitude. They were acting the part of Pharaoh, and they were also enslaving the land and giving it no rest. You know, they were supposed to observe the Shemitah year. Every seventh year, the land was to lay fallow and rest. The land was to have a Sabbath. But they never allowed it to rest, not even once, not even under David. I mean, it, it's staggering. They became Egypt to, you know, not only to one another, but also to the land itself, you know. And God was providing, you know, bumper crops in the six years, so they didn't have to do it. Now, worse... In doing so, they reflected badly upon God and made him look like the Egyptian gods or the Babylonian gods or the Assyrian gods or like every other god on the planet. Now, after the exile, I do have to say, we know that the Jews were totally cured of idolatry. <laughs> they were like unidolatrous on steroids. They wouldn't even allow their foreign occupiers to bring in standards or shields with people's faces or animals on them. More than once, they were willing to die in order to stop this from happening. It was, you know, it was really bewildering behavior to both the Greeks and the Romans, and even Pontius Pilate had to back down and pull his standards and shields out of Jerusalem that, I might add, he snuck in in the middle of the night because he knew there'd be a riot during the day. Well, that didn't help it. There was a riot the next day, and I can't remember if this was the specific event, but he, you know, the, the Jews were told, well, we're going to kill you if you don't allow this, and they actually put back their heads and they bared their throats in the crowd. And the Romans were like, dude... Oh, man, we are not going to win this one. These people are crazy. These people are nuts. Because you know, to the Romans and the Greeks and every other nation on earth, it was no big deal to have gods in addition to your normal country's gods. You know, they believed that um, different gods ruled over different areas of the earth. And... The god who was responsible for the sun making its way across the sky um, in Egypt, which was Ra, is totally different from, uh, is it Shamash in, um, in Babylonia or, or whoever in, in whatever other country. Just my mind is totally gone blank and I usually know these things. Oh well, that's okay. Um, but they saw regional gods, and it seems silly to us, right? It's like, well, how can a different god be responsible for the sun getting across the sky? I mean, it's the sun. But they didn't see the sun the way we did. For all they knew, it was a different sun. I mean, think about it. They, they weren't scientific. They were spiritual. And they saw everything in the world as, as spiritual. They didn't think of a god that created things that operated according to set schedules and scientific terms, and they pretty much ran themselves because he did such a good job in creating them. No, their gods were kind of wimpy and pathetic. Okay, so anyway, back to this. But um, as in the time of the Hasmonean priest kings in the uh, first century, um, before the Common Era, 
And I have some context for kids videos on that on my YouTube channel about them. Uh, they proved that they were just as oppressive as the Gentiles. I'm going to say that again. The Jewish kings that came after the uh, the Maccabeans, so starting with um, Simon Maccabeus' grandson, Aristobulus, they were just as oppressive as the Gentiles. And so it's his grandson, it's Simon's grandson and his great-grandsons, they could be monstrous beyond belief, slaughtering other Jews, even their own family members. Herod the Great, an Idumean, uh, who is uh, an Edomite. Uh, Idumea was uh, south of Judea, uh, descendants of Esau, uh, Jacob's brother. You know, Herod was an, a monster, but the Jewish leaders that he supplanted, that he replaced, were no better. Imagine allowing your own mother to starve to death in prison just so you could be king instead of your brother. And I mean, he did the same thing to his brother. Imagine slaughtering 800 of your political enemies through crucifixion after killing their wives and children before their eyes. These times, politically, saw the rise of the Pharisees. You know, as we talked about in another episode that I lodged uh, in between uh, parts two and three of this series, like it or not, no group exists in a cultural vacuum. And Yoma 9b of the Talmud says that the first century was a time of gratuitous hatred among the Jewish people, hating one another as well as outsiders. It was a time of terrible oppression, factions, robbing widows' houses, false oaths which could result in people being robbed of what they were owed, a frivolous divorce leaving innocent women bereft of support, uh, manipulating the laws so that someone can get out of or be prevented from supporting his elderly parents in their need. And Yeshua called them on all this stuff, okay? Um, no the Jews were no longer idol worshippers, but they worshipped mammon, money. Um, Yeshua, you might call him Jesus. He actually, there is actually, in one of the Gospels, it says that the Pharisees were lovers of money. And, and really, to be a Pharisee, you had to have a certain amount of money because you didn't have education unless you weren't. Okay, these were, uh, the Pharisees would have been, and the scribes would have been, um, Part of the retainer class serving the wealthy. And scribe, of course, was a job. So, they, uh, so because they worshipped mammon, money, in that they weren't that different from us. And we don't want to think that we worship money, but yes, we do. People who come up with, you know, we're people who come up with a million reasons not to care for the poor who take and take and take and give nothing back, always citing some verse out of context for why we should keep what is ours while taking freely from others. Um, you know, we're no different and even worse because at least the Pharisees were tithing above and beyond what they were required to do, even if it wasn't actually rooted in caring for the poor and Levites, which was the purpose of the tithe. You know, we pretend to care while generally doing nothing, yet demanding everything. So we're just as blind, only about different things. Remember, we never give anyone in the Bible, or we never give ourselves a pass while reading any story in the Bible, because there's always something there that applies to us. Always. Now, the only difference between us and the Pharisees is that we're judging the Pharisees while they didn't even know we exist, so they didn't judge us. <laughs> and Yeshua is telling them that all these things, quote-unquote, would come upon their generation. All these things that are related to the warnings of Matthew 24. That the temple would fall. That Jerusalem would fall in 70 AD after a four-year battle. I mean, he didn't give them this kind of detail. I'm telling you what happened. <laughs> 
that they would be under siege and in desperate need and subjected to terrible hunger and violence within and without. So there was sectarian violence going on among the Jews during this time and, of course, from the Romans from the outside. That they would even be expelled from the city permanently after the Bar Kokhba revolt in the 2nd century. And the Temple Mount would then be dedicated to Jupiter and Jerusalem and be and Jerusalem would actually be renamed Aelia Capitolina, and I hope I pronounced that correctly because I was bad and I didn't look it up. In essence, the fate of the Second Temple and the rebuilt Jerusalem, and I'm talking about rebuilt since the exile because it was left as a charred heap. So the fate of the Second Temple and the rebuilt Jerusalem was worse than the first. When Babylon conquered Jerusalem, they tore everything apart, they stripped everything down, yes, but they never turned Jerusalem and the Temple Mount into, they, they never dedicated it to idolatrous worship, they just left it alone. They didn't defile it. To them, even though it was another god, it was still somewhat holy ground. Okay, even though it wasn't to their God, they didn't go in and do what the Romans did, which was, um, you know, very much what Antiochus Epiphanes did, but the Romans got away with it. <sighs> so, it would be almost 1900 years before Jerusalem was out of Gentile hands. And the Temple Mount, save for a brief time in 1967, has never been returned to Jewish hands. Do you know, Jews can't go up there except for certain times. It's, it's under Muslim control. And of course, we've got that, we've got two, we've got the, sh the Dome of the Rock that, um, that sits exactly where the Holy of Holies was located. Over the bare patch of the top of Mount Moriah, where the Ark of the Covenant once sat during the days of Solomon's temple. They've got the bare bedrock of the top of Mount Moriah. And, and the, the Ark sat on top of that. And of course we've got the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And they don't even consider that their holiest site, so I mean it's kind of an insult, frankly. And it shouldn't be there. But... God gave it over to the Gentiles, okay? And the Temple Mount's still in the hands of the Gentiles. And as, as heartbreaking and, and offensive as it is, God still hasn't given it back yet. So let's go back to, we're reading from the uh, English Standard Version this week. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. Over the past 10 weeks now, we've been reading Matthew chapter 23 and Yeshua's polemic against the leaders who should have recognized their Messiah and would have if they weren't the gratuitously hateful generation rebuked by the later writers of the Talmud if they weren't oppressors, if they weren't so hung up on their social status and their legal minutiae, if their hearts were circumcised, if they had not truly proven themselves to be the descendants of the ones who kill the prophets. But they were. And I'm not sure that we're any better or different, just to lay it right out there. They sure thought that they were different and they kept God's laws better than we do. And they were still called lawless. They kept every Sabbath, every feast, truly ate clean, wore tzitziot and tassels. What? Tzitziot are tassels. I mean tzitziot and tefillin. Sorry. They prayed the Shema three times a day plus the Amidah. They observed ritual purity, etc., etc., etc. They lived radically different from the Greco-Roman culture in many ways, but not in a lot of the ways 
that really mattered. They stood by debating legalities while the overwhelming majority of Jews languished in abject poverty. Worst of all, they were leading people away from the Messiah and undermining what he was teaching and doing even as he was working miracles in front of their eyes. They saw the goodness, mercy, meekness, deliverance, miracles, and healing right before their eyes and then asked for a sign. But are we any different? I'm not sure if I was them with their, uh, there with them and and I wasn't saved already and know all the stuff that I know now that I would pass that test myself. Humans always think that their generation wouldn't kill the prophets, kill the Messiah, kill the Jews in the concentration camps, and then it happens and everyone asks, well, what happened? Because we're only different in our imaginations. It isn't so much that those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it, but that we repeat it even when we are aware of events past because we don't see ourselves as the villains of our own history. Our own offenses, fears, and prejudices tell us that this time is different and what we're doing is okay. I think these last lines were spoken with a with a genuinely broken heart. The heart of our God. Oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. I don't I I don't think it's even a plea anymore. I don't even think it's a rebuke. I think it's just a statement of fact now. And so what does Yeshua say then? See, your house is left to you desolate. <sighs> Actually, I'm going to stop right there and well, I'm not going to stop, but I'm going to say for the for the for the next part do you ever think about how we break God's heart? How we break God's heart? So the Pharisees broke God's heart. He didn't hate them. He didn't hate them. He didn't hate the Sadducees. He, he didn't hate the Essenes. He didn't hate the Amharats or the Zealots. You know, he loved them for the sake of the forefathers. And the scriptures are clear about that. They were loved for the sake of the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, Rachel. When God looks at history, you know, he doesn't look at it the way we do. We, we are detached from it. God is integrally a part of history. To God, I... I have to believe that history is a collection of memories of people, not facts and figures the way it is with us. To God, David wasn't someone to be studying the Bible. He was remembered and beloved. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Aaron, Joshua, Miriam, Samuel. All of these people, memories, and, and maybe even more than memories, because I don't know how eternity works. <laughs> but these aren't cold historical facts. These are people he loves. And just as I might have fond feelings of the wayward child of dear, dear, wonderful friends of mine, and look at them with pity because of the love that I have for my friends. Well, that's God, too. These were real people, and these were their children, which is why, historically, we see it took so long for judgment to happen. Because of his love, and because of his honoring of the ones that God called his friends. 
Anyway, we will be right back and we're going to talk about the temple being left desolate. Hi, I'm Tyler Don Rosenquist, and welcome back to the second half of Character in Context. And we are talking about, this is our very last teaching of the woes of Matthew 23, and we're even going to overlap slightly into Matthew chapter 24. When we left off, Yeshua has just given his heartbreaking lament, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. And then he said, see, your house is left desolate. And this is the most heartbreaking part of all in some ways. Uh, I I love the temple. I've been studying the temple for what five years under Joseph Good. Um, he's also he 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 also has a program called Measure the Pattern on Hebrew Nation Radio, and his website is JerusalemTempleStudy.com. And studying the temple with him just absolutely changed my life. But it it's opened my eyes to so much language in the scripture that I would have missed before and and this is a good example your house is left to you desolate let's go to Ezekiel 10 here starting in verse 18 and we're going to be delving um, deeply into um, the Hebrew scriptures here you might call it the Old Testament Ezekiel 10 starting in verse 18 then the glory of the Lord went out from the threshold of the house the house stood over the cherubim and the cherubim lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth before my eyes as they went out with the wheels beside them and they stood at the entrance of the east gate of the house of the lord and the glory of the god of israel was over them in ezekiel 11 starting in verse 22 then the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them and the glory of the God of Israel was over them and the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain that is on the east side of the city the mountain described to the east of the city is the Mount of Olives where Yeshua heads to after making his proclamation and leaving the temple but before he does he tells them your house is left to you desolate the Temple Mount was called Har Habayit, the mountain of the house, God's house, God's earthly throne. It was never called the Jew's house or the house of the Israelites. It belonged to God. It was his house. Yeshua called it my father's house. Isaiah 56, 6 through 8. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all peoples. It's always been called God's house, his house, the house of the Lord. Let us go up, you know. Well, that was let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. <laughs> but here is the Messiah calling it not his father's house, not my house, but your house. The scriptures in... Um, in Ezekiel 10 and 11 is a real pivotal moment in Israel's history and specifically the history of the house of Judah because it was at that point after pointing out to the prophet Ezekiel the abominations going on in the temple the uh, making cakes for the Queen of Heaven the weeping for Tammuz the the horrible abominations creeping crawling things 
carved on the walls. That the Spirit of God leaves the Holy of Holies, leaves the temple, leaves the temple mount, heads to the Mount of Olives. And we hear nothing more about that afterwards. The Spirit never came back. Okay? And Messiah just called it not, it called it your house. God is rejecting the temple once more because his people have rejected him and therefore have defiled the worship there. Right there on the Temple Mount, they had the perfect image bearer of God before them and they were denouncing and undermining him. It was the last straw for this generation. Just as the Spirit of God had visibly left the first temple in Ezekiel, the presence of God through Messiah is leaving the temple in Matthew chapter 20, at the end of Matthew chapter 23, the beginning of chapter 24. It's unmistakable. I'm going to read um, from Haggai chapter 2. He's one of the post-exilic prophets. We talked about his monument last week. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. And this, by the way, Haggai 1 is actually the chapter in scripture where God commands the building of the second temple. Under um, Haggai, Zechariah, Nehemiah, and Ezra. All right. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came to the ha came by the hand of Haggai the prophet, of course, seventh month, 21st day of the month. It is the last day of Sukkot and the day before the, um, it's, uh, it's the day before the eighth day of the festival, okay? Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not, for thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all the nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house, second temple, shall be greater than the former, Solomon's temple, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Now, the second temple, although God commanded it be built in Haggai chapter 1, was nothing as compared to the first. It was built under dangerous and even impoverished circumstances compared to the safety and <laughs> lavishness of Solomon's reign. And the presence of God never dwelt in his temple as it had Solomon's. And yet God claimed two things in speaking to the leaders of the exiles through Haggai. He said this temple would be greater than Solomon's. How can it be greater when it lacks the one thing that makes a temple great? The indwelling of the deity. Not only did it not have the indwelling of the deity, it didn't have the Ark of the Covenant. It didn't have, um, I was going to say something, I can't even remember. It didn't have the Ark of the Covenant. It, um, it didn't have the indwelling of the deity. Oh, um, the Urim and the Thummim that the high priest used to, um, cast lots to determine the will of God were gone. 
They had been, they had disappeared in the exile. So all these things were gone that had, that had been part of making the first temple. Great. But he said, he declared two things in speaking to the leaders of the exiles through Haggai. He said that the temple would be greater than Solomon's. You know, was it Herod's renovations? Certainly not. Although his renovations made it a wonder even greater than the temple of artifice, Ar artifice, Artemis in Ephesus, trying to say two words at once, that's just architecture and cannot measure up to the presence of God himself. So no matter how lavish you made the second temple, it still didn't have the presence of God in it. And so it was still an inferior temple. No. The second temple was greater because God's presence walked the grounds and taught and healed and delivered within that temple in the person of the Messiah. He was the walking embodiment of the presence of God among the people, and as Haggai said, in that place he gave peace to all who would listen and learn from him. When he was crucified within sight of the temple, he gave peace to the world. That's why the second temple was greater, and not because of the architectural genius of a murderous despot, which is why I don't call it Herod's temple, because it wasn't his, it was God's, it's the second temple. And if you want to understand more about Messiah is image bearer, uh, I did a broadcast and it'll be on my podcast channel and it was, it, it's called image bearing. I can't remember. It's like episode nine or something. I can't remember. And it's very important to understand why Messiah had to come and why he had to die and why we needed a walking, talking receptacle for for God's presence on earth for us so anyway I explain it better when I have it written down that's complicated anyway the Talmud in Yoma 9b 39b sorry tells us some facts about the last 40 years of the temple the sages taught during the tenure of Shimon Hatzarik the lot for God always arose in the high priest's hands after his death, it occurred only occasionally, but during the 40 years prior to the destruction of the second temple, the lot for God did not arise in the high priest's hand at all. So too, the strip of crimson wool that was tied to the head of the goat that was sent to Azazel did not turn white, and the westernmost lamb of the candelabrum did not burn continually, and the doors of the sanctuary opened by themselves as a sign that they would soon be opened by enemies. You need to know how heavy these doors were. They were huge. Oh, I wish I'd looked it up. They were something like 20 feet tall. I mean, they were huge and they were heavy and it needed, you know, it needed multiple men to open and close them and they were opening by themselves. You know, I believe those accounts. When Yeshua left the temple, God's favor departed from it. It didn't mean that he wouldn't still be worshipped there by the faithful. I mean, that is a commandment. And, and it wasn't undone when Yeshua died. And, you know, at Shavuot, um, after the resurrection, or Pentecost, you may call it, the 120 were all there in the house worshipping. Paul returned to sacrifice the Passover and to fulfill the sacrifice as part of his probably Nazarite vow as we read about him shaving his head earlier. God was still owed his worship there as long as it stood, but its days were numbered. But not forever. Before Yeshua left, he added, For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Those are the words of Psalm 118.26, the messianic psalm of all psalms. 
baruch haba bashem adonai we read it during the passover celebrations and we read it during the feast of tabernacles as we wave the lulav the four species it is a praise and a prayer for resurrection in the time of messiah so uh let's read the whole thing in the messianic jewish tree of life version see i've been reading from the esv up until this point praise adonai for he is good for his loving kindness endures forever let all israel say oh let israel say for his loving kindness endures forever oh let the house of aaron say for his loving kindness endures forever oh let those who fear adonai say for his loving kindness endures forever out of a tight place i called on adonai adonai answered me with a spacious place adonai is for me i will not fear what can man do to me adonai is for me as my helper i will see the downfall of those who hate me it is better to take refuge in adonai than to trust in man it is better to take refuge in adonai than to trust in princes all nations surrounded me in the name of adonai i cut them off they surrounded me yes all around me in the name of adonai i cut them off they swarmed around me like bees they were extinguished like burning thorns in the name of adonai i cut them off you pushed me hard to make me fall but adonai helped me adonai is my strength and song and he has become my salvation shouts of joy and victory are in the tents of the righteous adonai's right hand is mighty Adonai's right hand is lifted high. Adonai's right hand is mighty. I will not die but live and proclaim what Adonai has done. Adonai has chastened me hard but has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and praise Adonai. This is the gate of Adonai. The righteous will enter through it. I give you thanks because you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. It is from Adonai. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that Adonai has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hoshiana, please, Adonai, save now. We beseech you, Adonai, prosper us. Baruch, haba, Bashem, Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of Adonai. We bless you from the house of Adonai adonai is god and he has given us light join the festival with branches up to the horns of the altar you are my god and i praise you you are my god and i exalt you praise adonai for he is good for his loving kindness endures forever psalm 118 talks over and over again about the right hand of god the right hand of god is the messiah when Stephen was being stoned, he looked and he said that he saw the Messiah at the right hand of God. You know, as this is, um, as this psalm is a big part of the Passover celebration as well as the Feast of Tabernacles, there are many who believe that it is a sign of the season of not only the death of Messiah at Passover, but also the time of his return during the time of the fall feasts you know people debate about the day will it be on um, yom teruah the day of trumpets will it be on yom kippur the beginning of the jubilee um will it be on the first day of sukkot people have different theories but honestly we'll only know for sure on that day and not a day before so the temple, I mean, if it was that easy to figure out, Yeshua wouldn't have said, only the Father knows the day and time, because he would have said, well, obviously the stuff I'm saying and the scriptures, psh, that day, okay? He is smarter than we are. So the temple was left desolate and abandoned, and within 40 years it would be destroyed, along with the bulk of Jerusalem, by the Romans who would in the second century turn it into the pagan capital of the province devoted to jupiter 
of all the Jews, well, all of the Jews, you know, even those faithful to Yeshua and those, as well as those who did not accept him, were expelled and denied re-entry into the city. It must have seemed like the end of the world, and it was the end of the world as it existed. The second temple period was over. Not a new dispensation, as, as has been commonly and formally taught, but a world without a temple in Jerusalem, and even without the Jews in Jerusalem. As I mentioned in my teaching about the Pharisees, it fundamentally and slowly changed Judaism into what we see today. The priests waned in importance and, and took second seat to the emerging rabbis. And they had to find, the people had to find new ways to celebrate the feasts. And charity, good deeds took the place of sacrifices. You know, some of the changes were very good and very much needed. The Jews of later times, they recognized the hatred that existed in the first century and fundamentally changed some things. But sadly, Judaism split into a faction that was pro-Yeshua and a faction that went on without him. It actually took centuries for this to formally happen. And in the end, it, it really had to be legally enforced by the Roman government in the 5th century when they, when they decided to be Rome. And that meant government regulation of everything and especially regulation of the approved religions of the empire into neat little boxes with as little overlap as possible but that is a subject for another time for now it's enough to recognize that the jewish leadership of the first century misused their influence and missed their messiah and largely but not completely set the stage for future generations we have to recognize that while Yeshua was wildly popular in Galilee and hence came to Galilee um, after his resurrection, that's where he returned to. It was with the Jerusalem elites, it were, I'm sorry, it was the Jerusalem elites who ultimately had the power to make him or break his reputation. Among the general populace, we see this clearly both before and after the resurrection, leadership always will be held to a higher standard because it is the leadership who have the power to give direction to the populace in general. Yeshua could have said his woes to all Jews, but he didn't. Wouldn't have been reasonable. It wouldn't have been appropriate. What he did do was lament that the people of Judea and Jerusalem, and to a lesser extent, the other Jews of Roman Palestine, would pay the price for the actions of the leadership. But then, that's the story of the nation of Israel from Moses to the exile. And from the return of, from exile to the end of the Hasmonean line. And from Herod to the fall of Jerusalem in 70 of the Common Era. The story of God's people, them long ago and us today, never really changes. What has changed is that at the cross, the world was offered a greater and second exodus out of something greater than just Egypt and offered to more than just one nation. It offered a way out of the oppression of sin and death that held us all captive. Like leaven worked into three measures of flour, the gospel of the kingdom of heaven is still spreading, despite the evil we have done as a continuing people over and over again throughout history. And we haven't gotten it right. But you know, we haven't gotten it all wrong either. But, um, you know, we leave this teaching in a, in a sad place. Their house was left to them desolate. And Yeshua left the temple. And of course, within just a few days, he would be crucified. And yes, we see it from the other side of history. We see it as a glorious victory of God. 
but it was a lamentable thing to have happen. Is it's sad and it's tragic. And one of the things I love about having studied this is it really brought me home how much God loves the Jewish people and how Yeshua loved the Jewish people and loves. That's not in the past. Anyway, I have no idea what I'm going to teach after this series, but uh, I'll see you next week and we'll find out together.